Welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Grabert and I'm with Tuliomi. For those of you that don't know Tuliomi, we are a uh, nonprofit based in Woodland and we work in the inner coast range of California. So that's the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument area, the mountains between Highway 5 and Highway 101 in Northern California. We do a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, we do uh, educational programs, we lead hikes, we do trail maintenance, trail building. We also um, work on the Woodland Regional Park and um, just on the east side of Woodland. We are working on mercury mine remediations. We do a monthly column in local newspapers. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some really important stuff. <laughs> And well, I'm Andrew, sure I'll cover some of it as we... Uh, and as we Andrew go. is one of our founders. So we were founded in 2002. That was a long time ago. I've been <laughs> with the organization only about four and a half years. Before we start with Andrew, I want to tell everybody that next month on February 25th, we have Dr. Tom Batter, who's going to be talking about elk in the Berryessa Snow Mountain area up in this area and the story of California's Tule elk. So that will be February 25th. It's also an online Zoom meeting. So you go into our events and sign up just like you did for this. All right, with that, Andrew. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us away. here tonight. Um, I'm gonna do a presentation that's a, a little bit of a hybrid of something that I normally do with is a, uh, a Google Earth presentation. So if you see me staring into the distance, I'm not wistfully thinking, I'm looking at a second monitor that I'll be sharing with you guys. So uh, it'll be kind of a hybrid Google Earth and slideshow. And um, Bill, you can keep admitting folks as they, as they come in, I'll be turning my attention to the other monitor here. Yeah. And what I'm gonna be talking about is a combination of what Tuliomi is working on, but also really about how you can get outdoors and how you can see the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument region that we've worked so hard on protecting. And I'll kind of weave in some of the stories of things we've done out there and some of the outings that I've done, um, along with a couple signature trails that we have of a large number of trails that are in this region. I'll be sharing a link uh, later in the chat uh, to a very large data set that I've compiled over the years that's uh, for Google Earth, which is a free piece of software that probably most people have now. And that will have all the trails and campgrounds and borders and boundaries and such uh, in it. It's a pretty cool data set and uh, I need to continuously be looking at it and updating it, but it's a, a way that I compiled information from Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service and myself uh, to use as a reference, a digital reference, if you will, uh, for getting outdoors and enjoying the region. So as Bill said, I'm Andrew Folks. I'm one of the co-founders of Tuliomi have been here since the beginning working on things and my main focus has been on getting folks outdoors because my main impetus was having grown up in the Bay Area, I spent a lot of time in the hills in the open space districts in the Bay Area. When I moved up here to Davis, I needed to find places to go. So I started exploring and as I started exploring, I started carrying my GPS unit with me. And as I started carrying my GPS, I carried a camera, which eventually luckily became a digital camera I compiled thousands of photographs of the area, hikes, adventures, and doing that for well over 20 years uh, now, gosh, 24, 25. And uh, that's part of what these discussions are, uh, these, these talks, is I kind of share some of the adventures I've been on, some of the photos. And, and I say adventures because some folks uh, who are probably in this room have been on some of these hikes with me. And sometimes I lead folks on things that mountain goats might enjoy more than humans. Uh, I just, I have this love of just getting out and exploring, you know, so whether or not the exploring means traipsing through the brush or through the open meadows or running the river, uh, even as I, as I get a little bit older, uh, when I started this organization, my hair was a different color and there was more of it. I still go out there and do these things and, uh, as much as I can and, and as much as my hips will let me, uh, been finding that there's a whole bunch of different things folks can do when they go out here. So I'm going to share the screen. We're going to get started. So with Google Earth, I find that with the uh, uh, 
Uh, the Zoom rooms, you know, depending on my bandwidth and your bandwidth, you might find things to be choppy. So I tend to use Google Earth more statically. I'll, I'll zoom into an area, then I'll pause and talk about it a little bit rather than try to continuously move around like I might do in person, uh, just to try to avoid some of the motion sickness that folks might get otherwise. And like I said, I'll toggle over to some of the, uh, the slides as well when I talk about these individual spots. So with that. Andrew, we'll just one little interruption. Yes. Uh, I forgot to talk about the chat. So if a big part of this presentation or every presentation is asking questions, so you're welcome to ask questions, please ask them in the chat. And uh, I'll be monitoring those. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through the questions and, and we'll have lots of time to, for Andrew to answer questions. If you're not Perfect. familiar with the chat, go to the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little button in there that says chat. If you click on that, the chat will come up and you'll be able to, to see it and, and message people. All right, sorry, go ahead, Dan. All right. All right, so I always, I always start out a little off the planet. Um, so I'm assuming everyone can see the screen, Bill. I, again, we're doing a tech check, so you can see my, uh, yes, my planet see here. All right, so we're good to go. So Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument Region is this large green outline that you can see here. And it encompasses uh, basically three units, one sort of the main Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument unit, the Cedar Ruffs Wilderness unit, and the unit around uh, Cache Creek, or rather uh, Cold Canyon. So for reference, I'm, I'm broadcasting, you know, live in uh, 360 from uh, Davis right around here. And as you can see, we've got a, a, an area that we've protected here, been Tuliomi's primary focus, uh, this region and then as a campaign, which in 2015 was uh, designated by President Obama, that's almost 100 miles long and over 331,000 acres. Within here is just a wealth of both wildlife, uh, geology, history from both European and, and and uh, Native American, and plants uh, like you wouldn't believe. And I'll show some of the photographs of, of those. And I won't have time to go into all of those items. So a lot of this will be sort of a taste. And I always like to give a taste to hope folks get a chance to go out there and explore. On the top, it gets rid of everybody else. So we're gonna zoom in here and first talk about some of the floats. So. Folks um, often ask, you know, how can I enjoy this uh, by water? And one of the best ways to get in there is to kayak the wilderness stretch of Cache Creek. And Cache Creek uh, runs all the way from, uh, well, the North Fork of Cache Creek, Indian Valley Reservoir, and the main stem of Cache Creek comes out of Clear Lake and runs right through the heart of both the Cache Creek Wilderness, which is a federal congressional designation to Leomi uh, was the lead on, and through the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument. And the river itself is a state wild and scenic river, which was the very first campaign to Leomi worked on. So it's, it's kind of neat. I like to say that it's uh, triple protected. We've got a uh, state wild and scenic river in a federal wilderness area in the midst of a national monument. So when you're going through uh, Cache Creek, it's a, a class two uh, waterway. It's got one class three rapid within the wilderness run stretch and then another class three a little further down uh, called the Mother Rapid down uh, by the Highway 16 bridge. And it starts off uh, pretty straightforward, but for folks that go in to kayak this, I always say either go with someone who knows what they're doing in there uh, or yourself, having done uh, something of similar difficulty and be prepared to spend the entire day or two days back there because it's a 19 and a half mile run and that's a, that's a minimum. You start at Highway 20 and put in on the North Fork, run two miles down the North Fork and then uh, the remainder 17 miles all the way down to the uh, Bear Creek, Cache Creek confluence. And that's the next time you're gonna see uh, a road. So. Once you're in, you're committed. There's only one way in, one way out. The geology 
as you float through is, is just amazing. You pass through a lot of uh, serpentine areas. And so you get a lot of these vertical cliffs where big clay cliffs, blue clay cliffs that have eroded, uh, where you get a lot of um, uh, cliff swallows that are nesting on the edges of these cliffs that rebuild their nest every year as portions collapse and they go back in and they rebuild where it looks like the river goes right into the rock and then makes a hard, hard turn. And you see a lot of the uh, tectonic, tectonic uplift where a lot of the rapids in the Cache Creek wilderness are created where the water is flowing across these various sedimentary layers of different thicknesses. And so you can see them coming in at an angle here. This is another one of those great shots I love because it looks like the river just basically is going okay. right into the rock. And the reality is, uh, and actually Bill, if you can yeah, mute the uh, participants, uh, I get feedback, um, starts to bend around uh, and moves through the mountains. You really get a sense of this geology. When the late Eldridge Moores went down on a trip with us, it was great because he kept pointing out all the fault lines in the rocks. He goes, oh yeah, there's a fault over there, there's a fault over there. Uh, so, you know, the area is still extremely active geologically. And a lot of the early stretches when you come down, it's fairly, um, fairly calm water, not a lot of uh, rapids. It's a good way of kind of getting your feet wet, so to speak, pun intended. Beautiful riparian forests. I've seen more um, bears back here than I've ever seen bears anywhere. And great places to camp. There's uh, sandy beaches, rocky beaches, areas thick with vegetation. If you know the, the right places in the river, you can get some really great places to camp. This particular spot is, uh, we call this bear camp because once I saw a bear walk right through the middle of this uh, rocky um, deposit out here and we were downwind so the bear didn't smell us. His nose is in the air and the sun's setting and the bear's coat was this deep cinnamon and the whole coat was glowing. And so one member of our party who hadn't seen the bear turned around, saw the bear and screamed, bear! <laughs> and the bear's eyebrows, it looked like one of those cartoons where the eyebrows go up above the head and the bear's startled and he takes off into the hills. It goes running right through the back here and you just hear him crashing through the brush. The bears here aren't really like you'd have in Tahoe. They're not used to seeing people. So when they see people, they, they scoot. This particular uh, spot, this particular camp, switching back to Google Earth here, is located right down here about midway through the run. So you can see that view uh, in that photograph without, of course, us taking up the uh, picture there, looking down right in this section. And the neat part about this is you can see this rapid right here. You take this rapid, you pull out, dry off, and there's your camp for the night. But historically, the channel used to actually run around the back here. And in high flows, it still does. But you can walk back there and see kind of the old channel. And all these deposits, it's just this little quirk of where it is that all the sand drops out right where we camp. So a lot of other parts of the creek have uh, pretty rocky shorelines. And while you could still camp there, it's really nothing like uh, hanging out on a, on a sandbar. And when you're in there, it's just, it's remote. It's wonderful. Bald eagles galore. Tremendous in the, um, tremendous in the uh, wintertime, but uh, even in the summertime, bald eagles nest, bald, bald eagles are floating by you. There's plenty of places to pull out. This is above the camp, but we call this the jumping rock. And it's at the end of Wilson Valley. And Wilson Valley, just upstream from the camp here. Change my view to go upstream. You can see Wilson Valley right here and the, uh, the jumping rock. Wilson Valley is, is right here. And you can kind of see this little cut right there. Well, that little cut is this little cut right here where we pull out. And I always advise folks, when you float down this, 
just pull off sometimes and just hike up the hill. You get these amazing views of the creek that you wouldn't otherwise. And you just get this sense of how large it is and how big a space you're in. And of course, when you're at the jumping rock, you have to partake of the jumping rock. There's a nice deep pool right out here that's scoured out. So you jump in there, you float downstream, get out of the sandbar, walk back up, you know, do it again. And it's a great place when you're having lunch in the middle of the wilderness. In this case, so we call these uh, items that we find along the river, we call it river booty. River booty are those objects you didn't bring with you, but you find along the way. So a lot of things come out from uh, uh, Clear Lake over the dam and make their way down the stream, unfortunately. And so we try to harvest those and, uh, and reuse them. In this case, we had a, a little inflatable inner tube and my son, who I think was probably about eight or nine at the time, uh, we would float down this stretch during lunch, get out at that jumping rock, walk back upstream, float back down again. And there are these hidden treasures in there uh, that you can only get to by boat. This particular one off Trout Creek, jumping back up. When you get into the end of Wilson Valley, you enter what I call the canyon stretch. And that's a stretch of uh, the creek where you enter this deeper canyon, not as many um, uh, big valleys and such. And Trout Creek back here has a waterfall that you can kind of see where it is in this rock up here. And it's only about maybe 200 feet off the river, uh, but you don't really see it unless someone's shown it to you. And so luckily folks had shown it to me and it's really cool because it cascades off into this nice pool that you can get into. And this cascade runs even in the summertime. Uh, it's spring fed as well as having a fairly large watershed. And when you start climbing further up these side canyons, in some cases, having to shimmy yourself up uh, between the rocks, you come across more and more waterfalls. Again, no trails going back there. This is all in the wilderness. Uh, and you finally end up at Trout Creek, about a quarter mile up the canyon, climbing up those various small, smaller waterfalls to a larger waterfall that you can get underneath. And at that point, getting up further is fairly hard because it's real slippery rock and it's where the canyon just has a big notch the waterfall comes out of the notch. And then you continue on down the river, again, enjoying the oak woodlands, looking at the amazing geology. Sometimes folks even bring their pets, uh, dogs that are acclimated to the water. That's kind of fun. We had these uh, two dogs once where um, one of them did not like the rapids. And so that dog, uh, Every time there'd be a rapid, it'd turn its head. And then there was another dog, absolutely loved the rapids, but it would bite at them. <laughs> so every time water would splash across the bow, the dog would be chomping at the, at the rapids. This is uh, Stephen McCord, who's uh, uh, chairman of the uh, Puda Creek Council. And so I felt like uh, I had to at least get somebody from Puda Creek to go into Cache Creek and enjoy that watershed a little bit. We work together with uh, Stephen on a lot of uh, joint projects uh, in the watershed, some of our mine remediation projects. And then at the end of the wilderness run, there's the Mad Mike Rapid. I'm gonna show you guys kind of where that is. So, so we start floating down the river, continuing down past Buck Island which is the earliest you might see other humans uh, because there's a four wheel drive road that goes down there. And I'll show some photos of that later on. Uh, there's a BLM campground down here. And then once you pass that back into the wilderness stretch until you get down to uh, Highway 16 at the Bear Creek Cache Creek confluence. And just at the monument boundary here, you can see this rapid and that is the Mad Mike Rapid, which is kind of the good photo point because you pause just above it, you run through it, eddy out at the end, you can come back to these rocks and get a, a fantastic view of folks going through. 
we've had everything for whitewater canoes uh, go through there down the stretch. Um, see this one of uh, a friend Beth who uh, caught some really big air on that particular one, mostly because she went right over the rock <laughs> instead of around the rock. And I like this one because it shows how long I've been doing this. Uh, so when we first started working on protection of the river, I didn't, I didn't, uh, or my son had just been born actually. And here he is at, uh, he's nine in this photo. And then they graduate to him being uh, 15. And uh, he's 19 now, but still goes with us down the river. But it's kind of cool from a father's perspective to be able to take your kids every year, multiple times down the river till they graduate to their own boat and enjoy whitewater as much as you do. Now I'm gonna give just a really quick synopsis of some of the plants that we have up here just to show that springtime is an amazing time to go up there. As hard as it is to see all the water, or not the water rather, see all the um, uh, fires that have gone up there in the past few years, uh, particularly starting in 2015 with the Jerusalem fire and Rocky fires and then again in 2018 and again in 2020, uh, it really is conducive to a lot of wildflowers. So I expect, especially with the rains that we've been getting, late March and April into May, you're going to have some pretty amazing wildflowers in the mountains to our west. There's also a lot of wildlife up there too. This is a uh, bear footprint. If you can make it out here with my hand for uh, size reference on the edge of Cache Creek. Some of the bald eagles I'd mentioned, this is taken uh, from the boat with a camera, with a zoom lens while I was floating by, taking pictures of the, the bald eagles looking at you uh, in the summertime. Great shots. And it's always just fantastic to see them. They're such a large bird and so distinct that when they're floating up above, you can always recognize the bald eagle. Again, more wildflowers. The uh, absolutely love the irises up there. I've seen them both in the yellow and uh, and the sort of bluish purple as well. And the Clarkias, which just go nuts on the banks up there. In this whole area, uh, whether you go to Walker Ridge, uh, north of Highway 20, or down in the Cache Creek zone, the wildflowers are abundant. We actually have banana slugs here. This is a big banana slug. This thing's probably about as long as my hand. And found that one actually in Cold Canyon. Uh, garter snakes galore. Can't tell you how many times we've had uh, garter snakes swim alongside us as we're boating down. In this case, I found one off of a tributary. I like to hike the canyons. So just pull off boat on the side, just go up a canyon for a while, see what you can see. Always have to be on the lookout for rattlesnakes, but I actually don't mind a snake that warns you when you get too close. Another uh, shot of garter snake. Um, the, uh, the newts are in abundance up there. This was taken with an underwater camera uh, that I've got. This new photo was actually taken in that pool where the waterfall cascades down into. So now I want to talk a little about some of the hikes. Now uh, I've talked about uh, the, the float that I'd recommend. And before I get into it, I just want to mention for these floats, uh, there's a number of resources, both Tuliomi's website as well as uh, uh, California Creeks that talk about the various uh, floats in California. You can look up Cache Creek. There's both the Wilderness Run and the lower we call Fun Run, which goes from uh, Highway 16 and Bear Creek, Cache Creek Confluence down to Camp Haswell or all the way down to Rumsey. A uh, lot of white water there, very fun. Uh, parallels the highway the whole way, so not quite the wilderness experience, but a half day trip, a little shorter, uh, about six and a half miles. So not as long as the, uh, the full day trip. So one of the uh, projects that Tuliomi has worked on uh, has been trail building, working with um, both federal and state and uh, local partners. And one of the partners we're working with right now is Yolo County and Valley Vista Regional Park. Valley Vista Regional Park is the newest county park 
and it's located above Rumsey. It's just inside the National Monument. For reference, uh, town of Rumsey is down here and Valley Vista is just a couple miles above Rumsey on Highway 16. And the county uh, acquired this property, I wanna say early 2000s. I'll have to look at my records because I've been on the county parks committee for just about as long as Tuliomi has been around. And we acquired this through a couple grants, but we didn't have the funds, the county, we putting that hat on uh, to build the trail network. So I volunteered uh, to be the lead on that as a volunteer working with Tuliomi. And so Tuliomi volunteers and in combination with uh, Eagle Scouts have done all the trail infrastructure in the park. So this uh, line work that you see here is our initial um, three miles that we've done. Actually, I think we're up to four now. We had a three mile loop and then we just added one, uh, finished that one up in October, November. And it does a nice lasso loop up on the ridge and around the bend. And we just finished and is now open this other half mile loop that goes up through a valley here up to the ridge to make a longer loop. Uh, so you can actually, everything red here are existing fire breaks. And then the green is our most recent trail and the orange are, was the earlier trails that we built. And so we also have another uh, trail plan to go around this part of the canyon and I'll probably be exploring that one this coming fall uh, as a new trail. So up at Valley Vista, it's, its namesake uh, is the Valley Vista. When we were coming up with the name for the trail, one of the parks committee members uh, came across an old black and white photograph taken from this point where you see people sitting, looking out in the valley and the photograph was titled the Valley Vista. And so we thought, what a perfect name for the park. And we named that and the first trail, uh, Valley Vista Park or in Valley Vista Trail. In order to make the loop, we had to do some serious trail construction and rock work just in this one little section. So most of the trail, while it's on a slope, uh, you know, it's dirt track, no worries. But there was one section we spent, gosh, three work days, I think on just blasting through that rock by hand to make the trail tread uh, and this was the steepest cross section of the trail, but it allows us to make the loop. But the views are so worth it. This is looking down at Cache Creek. You can see Highway 16 going up the canyon. We're inside the monument here. This little peak over here is Glasscock Mountain, which is another hike I, I want to talk about. And it's just a phenomenal view. And, and I think that this view is as gorgeous as the view into the Cape Bay Valley. So gorgeous that we had an Eagle Scout that just completed uh, for his badge um, and his rank uh, a bench, uh, an aluminum bench, so it won't burn, that looks out on this exact view down the canyon. Then across from Valley Vista Park is Glasscock Mountain. And Glasscock Mountain, right up here, is on Cortina Ridge. And from up there, you can look out into the Central Valley and down into the Cape Bay Valley. And you can get up there on a, uh, a, a fire road. It's a fairly steep hike. There's actually several ways up there, but the one I'm gonna talk about is the fire road. And that actually starts uh, just across the bridge in Cache Creek and winds its way up here. And it's actually a lot more visible now if I show you the, uh, <laughs> The current aerial photo, this one was actually smoky at the time because of the fires. You can see the fire road here that goes up. A little bit harder to see when it goes into the woods, but easy to follow when you're on the ground. And so when you cross the highway, you'll see a little gate there. It says Yolo County uh, property, and you go back through there and hike up to the, to the mountain. And from the top of the mountain or the hike up the mountain, you get views of the creek. From the top of the mountain, you get these amazing endless views back into the Cache Creek Wilderness area. Yolo County's middle campground, uh, overnight campground is right down here at a bend in Cache Creek. And I'd be remiss of uh, talking about um, this area if I didn't mention the Blue Ridge, Fist Creek, Frog Pond, 
and the adventures that one can have when you go back off of County Road 40, cross the low water bridge, which is slated to be replaced. Uh, so we won't have to worry about that washing out anymore. But to go up into the Blue Ridge, looking across at Fisk Peak here, and to go up there in particular this time of year when the sun gets low, and you get some of those amazing views of the monument. And even going up Ray House Road further up, it's a great mountain bike ride. It's a great hike. Um, folks are allowed to go up there in dirt bikes and four wheel. Well, we created this monument. We brought all the users together that wanted to preserve this place and said, you know, there is room for everyone up here. There's so much opportunity to legally ride your off-highway vehicles, to car camp, to camp in a campground, to backpack, to day hike, to mountain bike, to float, to horseback ride, even hang glide. We had hang gliding groups that were involved in the preservation of this area. And this is Fisk Pond, which is kind of this neat uh, little pond that uh, enterprise columnist Bob Dunning used to really like to go up to. And uh, he kind of called it his little secret lake. And to give you guys a reference of, of where that is. So we're here at the low water bridge crossing over Cache Creek. And as you go to the south on road 40, you go all the way up to the four corners and then you, you basically head south from the four corners or sort of south, southeast. And sitting up on top of a ridge is a lake and it's a, a little spring fed lake in a most unusual place to find a lake on the top of a ridge, right? Very tiny watershed, basically everything I'm outlining here, but keeps pretty constant, constant water level. And I've seen fish in there, which again is one of those wild, like how did a fish get up here? A uh, great little wetland area, a nice little riparian grove. And if you're uh, so inclined, you can go down to Buck Island on Langs Peak Road and traverse the ridge the whole way down and go down to where you float by down here at Buck Island. And down here at Buck Island, I think the aerial photograph will show you there's two little structures here. Those are both uh, BLM precast uh, concrete uh, toilets. And so a lot of folks come by here on Jeep and camp. I've seen families down there together having a blast all ages because they're able to get into the heart of this area with this um, with this one access road with the surrounding wilderness area. Again, they opening up the opportunities for enjoyment of the region for everyone of all abilities. And so you can get back there. Uh, this is some of the views, there's Glasscock Mountain off to the side here and then Blue Ridge is over here, Fisk Peak, being able to go in with the quad. Um, this was uh, uh, Roger Madison and I went up there. He came up on his uh, dirt bike, uh, which was the only way we could get up there after um, the low water bridge was closed. And we actually went up there to do maintenance on the hiking trail. So this was the Blue Ridge Trail South Trailhead we were able to get to with the uh, dirt bikes and then uh, got our hand tools out and started working on the hiking trail. And this is looking down toward Lake Berryessa. So when you're up there at the watershed divide up there by the, the uh, Fisk Pond, um, you get to see all the way into the Puget Creek watershed, uh, which is also part of the National Monument, not the lake itself, but all the mountains surrounding. And ultimately all the way down to Cache Creek. Uh, so I, I like to say I've, I've reached this creek by hiking, biking, uh, four wheel and uh, kayak. <laughs> so kind of, I, I say I'm a, uh, uh, equal opportunity recreationalist. If there's a way to get outdoors and enjoy it, I'm, I'm there. So the next hike I wanted to touch on as we move away from Cache Creek, but we're still in that watershed, is the High Bridge Trail. And the High Bridge Trail is one off of uh, Highway 16 that goes into the Bear Creek unit of the Cache Creek uh, resource area. It's right on the edge of the National Monument, but the monument and the wilderness boundary runs along Cache Creek Ridge proper. So this, this uh, line right on here is the edge, and this is all part of the Cache Creek watershed and monument adjacent. And this, uh, 
almost, gosh, I'm going to say 20,000 acres, but I think it's a little less than that. Uh, it was started to be purchased. It used to be a private ranch south of Highway 20, west of Highway 16. And it, it really was perfect acquisition because it gave access to the BLM land and made a contiguous piece of, of publicly owned property, basically bounded by the highway, uh, Highway 20 and Highway 16. And it was acquired starting in 1999. Over three years, they purchased it in chunks through Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, funds, and then opened it to the public. And the High Bridge Trail was one of the first trails actually constructed that wasn't just an old ranch road. And so because of that, uh, this trail is built as a trail. So it's a 5% grade that, that switchbacks up the mountain. Uh, this is a photo of it just after it was completed. And it's a beautiful horseback riding, biking, and, and hiking trail that takes you up uh, into a number of ponds, looking back into brushy sky high and the mountains above the Cache Creek Wilderness, the southern end of the Cache Creek Wilderness and the Cache Creek Watershed. So it's a great way to approach kind of from the north side to get down uh, up above Cache Creek, but also to enjoy the numerous ponds. This particular pond we call Swimming Pond, though my friend John Reynolds calls it a Bass Pond. So it sort of shows you uh, what our orientations are for use of this space in our recreation. But here we are leading a, a hike, you know, pre-COVID days, uh, and we'll be there again hiking up to this particular pond while most of them are stock or former stock ponds that are um, fed by rainfall runoff. So they fluctuate in their height and some fill up in winter and uh, are dry by summer. This one uh, never loses water. It's a spring fed pond. So has really healthy fish populations, only varies in a couple feet by its uh, elevation through the seasons. And as you continue on through the trails in the Cache Creek, uh, Bear Creek unit, you go through some gorgeous oak woodlands and you can ultimately end up on Cache Creek Ridge looking down into, um, into Cache Creek. This particular view is looking down into uh, Buck Island here and Cache Creek as it bends around through the wilderness. Now we're gonna move into, since I was looking back that direction, move into the um, Hooda Creek watershed in the National Monument. And we're gonna come down here into the Knoxville State Wildlife Area. And within the Knoxville State Wildlife Area, there's this beautiful valley called Zim Zim Valley. And Zim Zim Valley goes for three and a half miles up the valley and you hardly gain any elevation at all. It's a wonderful hike for folks of all ages. So you do about a seven mile round trip uh, and there's only about 400 feet of elevation gain in that whole distance. And that valley takes you all the way up to Zim Zim Falls. And Zim Zim Falls is a 100 foot waterfall. And waterfalls in the Northern Inner Coast Range are a little bit more rare. Waterfalls in the Sierra are in abundance. There's snow fed, not rainfall fed, um, They've got all that granite to work with, whereas we have a lot more uh, you know, softer materials. And so we don't get those really precipitous drop-offs, but for whatever reason, we have this harder rock in here. And while this valley was being created and head cut back as the water uh, went through it, it hit this harder rock. And the harder rock stopped the erosion further back. And as it eroded down in front of the rock, created this waterfall. And as you get closer to the waterfall, you really start getting a sense of the waterfall until you get up below the waterfall and you really start to, to enjoy the size of this beautiful feature within the National Monument. So to get there, uh, again, all these directions you can find to these various hikes and a lot more, because I'm only touching on, like I say, giving folks a, a, a taste you can find all these directions on Julio Abney's website. We have a get outdoors section. You can look at all the hikes. Uh, I think they're organized by county. Um, Bill can show you some of that uh, later or I can, I can pull that up uh, during some of the Q&A. And those will give you directions how to get there. This particular one you get to by driving up around Lake Berryessa from uh, Berryessa Knoxville Road onto Knoxville Road. 
and I believe this one's at mile marker 24 is the trailhead. Now, presently, this site is closed because it was part of the LNU complex fire and uh, Department of State Fish and Wildlife for this particular trail that managed this area. Uh, after fires, they tend to shut it down until they get a nice flush of green grass growth. And so typically this would reopen by about March. Um, that's what happened the previous fire when the county fire went through in 2018. Uh, and I just drove by all of this several weeks ago on uh, Knoxville Road and it, it was still closed and it was still uh, pretty burned in the sense that, you know, the ground was still pretty black. Uh, the germination hadn't really started because we haven't had a tremendous amount of rain, but I expect after these rains, we're going to see quite a bit of uh, germination. Then we're gonna move on to one that's my personal favorite. Now, this is a very hard hike. Only folks that are really, really up for it. It's also uh, presently in the site of the um, LNU complex and previously the county fire. This is the um, Berryessa Peak Trail. And the Berryessa Peak Trail starts at mile marker 20. Right, let me see if I can pull this one up here. This one, I don't know why. There we go. And various peak trail starts at mile marker 20 and goes all the way to various peak, its namesake. And that's at elevation 3057. And various peak trail is one that uh, had been, various peak had been inaccessible until Tuliomi was able to get an easement across this little piece of private property right here and some corner crossings at other parcels to get us on the main BLM parcel that makes up Berryessa Peak unit. And you can actually see the Berryessa Peak Trail now moving across the BLM where we cut it. And we built this trail. This was my life goal was to get access to this mountaintop. And I said, I wanna get this done before I'm 40. And I completed it, I think two months before I turned 40. It's a 15 mile round trip, uh, 3,500 foot elevation gain. And when we were building it, we built it in all conditions, including uh, snow, <laughs> which was pretty fantastic to think about building a trail in snow. There was an extra step involved in this though. Uh, before building a trail, usually we'd, you know, we'd scrape the, the, the grass off and then we'd dig in the dirt. Well, in this case, we had to actually scrape the snow off and then dig in the grass and then dig in the dirt. I think this was the hardest trail construction I've ever had to do. But the views are amazing. You're, you're walking through these gorgeous oak woodlands and across these tremendous uh, cross slopes that lead to these views of Berryessa that you just, there's nowhere else that has views like this other than um, the Berryessa Peak Trail. Uh, this particular uh, photo I, I enjoy because I entered it in a photo contest and I won one of those Tilly Endurables hats. Uh, until that point in my life, I didn't know that a hat could cost that much money. So buying one was not an option for me. So winning a hat was the highlight of uh, this photograph for me. And then as we stay in the Peter Creek watershed, and move down to the Cold Canyon area. Now Cold Canyon between it and Blue Ridge are two of the first places I visited as I started extending my fingers out to discover what was in the hills. So there's a real special place for me at Cold Canyon. And another place that I discovered that was adjacent to Cold Canyon is the Puda Creek State Wildlife Area. And the Puda Creek State Wildlife Area are public lands adjacent to Cold Canyon. It's one canyon to the east. And getting there, there's not really any trails. You walk basically along Pewter Creek, uh, hugging the cliffs until you get up into the open uh, oak woodlands. And then you follow an old fire road up to uh, the big snaggletooth rocks that are up here. And the rock formations are just gorgeous. You can see all the vertical uplift as you start walking back there, uh, large, massive house-sized boulders just laying on top of each other, pointing skyward as you traverse the ridges. 
uh, allowing a lot of cross slope uh, walking to get up there to get to these snags. And you can actually see these snags from Highway 128. So if you're, a, if you're a driver in the car, keep your eyes on the road. If you're a passenger in the car, take a look to the south as you're heading up or down uh, 128 and you're in the inner dam stretch between Lake Solano and Monticello Dam. And take a look for these snaggletooth rocks that you see up there and know that that's part of the Puda State Wildlife Area. And you hike back up there and you get inside and you realize just the size of these rock formations, just outstanding. And if you're really adventurous, you can hike off trail up Wild Horse Canyon, which is just off of Cold Canyon, and find this hidden waterfall back there. This is my son, I think he was probably about seven years old at this time. It's a mile of off trail wading through the water. And we did this in December one year. And uh, I realized that with kids, they don't care if they're wet, they just care if they're cold. So you get them the boots, you get them the gloves, you get them the, the cold weather gear and they're game for anything. So it's a wonderful hike, but zero trail. Uh, you gotta go off trail to get there, but the reward is definitely worth it. And the heading uh, a little bit further north from there to really show you the diversity of the monument. A lot of what you've seen is the Blue Oak Woodland and a lot of Chamise Chaparral that a lot of us here kind of in the Davis and Central Valley area are really used to, don't realize the amazing conifer forests in the monument, just a little bit north of Highway 20 and Indian Valley Reservoir. As we start getting into uh, the Snow Mountain Wilderness area and the Mendocino National Forest. And within the Snow Mountain Wilderness, the Snow Mountain itself, one of these amazing geologic formations that you start at the bottom of Snow Mountain and you're in the Oak Woodland, Chaparral, Serpentine. And as you walk up the mountain, you change into conifer forests and then finally get above Timberline when you're on the top. There are a lot of different trails that can take you in there. I recommend the Summit Springs Trailhead if you've got a sport utility, you can get up there, no problem. It's on gravel roads. Most of the Mendocino uh, is graveled. In fact, I think it's the only national forest that doesn't have a paved road crossing it. And that'll get you up to the Summit Springs Trailhead. And from there, it's only a couple miles up to the summit. Um, so if you're older, or if you have younger kids, it's a great place to start. If you really want a little bit more adventure, or, or uh, adventure rather, you can start at Fout Spring down here and you basically hike the entire thing up. So instead of driving up M10 here to take you up to the summit or near the summit, you start at the bottom. So you gotta earn the summit when you start there. But the views are gorgeous looking out across uh, the, the conifer forest, even post burn. A lot of uh, rock formations on the ridges. I am sort of obligated to take these photographs so that my wife gets scared whenever I take the kids out to <laughs> the middle of the woods. Like, what did you have them do? It's not as crazy as it looks. Uh, they're not that far off the ground. And then when you get onto uh, Snow Mountain uh, proper and you see the various peaks you can, you can hike to, when you get above Timberline, there's both a Snow Mountain East and Snow Mountain West. You know, the very of Snow Mountain National Monument ranges from about 400 feet in elevation over 7,000. So there's so much diversity within the monument that there is to explore. And Snow Mountain lives up to its name. Even during a, a drought year, went up there in May and there was still snow, big snow drifts across the north facing banks. And it's kind of cool to be in the coast range and have snow. And I know you can get it as you move, you know, further up towards Shasta and such, but this is about as far south as you can get and have snow remain into May and sometimes even June in a heavy snow year uh, and be within the National Monument. So in conclusion, get out there and jump in feet first, go and explore this amazing place that we have, check out our webpage, go on some of our hikes. Some folks, uh, have learned and explored this place by joining us. If you think, you know, I just don't know exactly where to go. It's you know, I'm a little nervous. Um, go on one of the hikes with Nate or Bill. And it's, we found a lot of people that have gone with us and say, this is great. Uh, I was a little nervous coming up here because, you know, you never know, am I allowed to go back here? 
but once we got back here and you guys started pointing all the places we could go, now we'll start going off on our own. And that's what we really like to see is people just, you know, jump off uh, feet first, enjoy the area and just experience all of the just amazing views and wonder that this place uh, has to explore. What I wanna share with folks here in the chat is I have a file that uh, I wanna share that's all of the, um, copy the link here and then put it in the chat box here. Everyone in the meeting. And if you uh, select that, you should be able to download the, uh, it's like either a KML or a KMZ, I forget which one, one of the uh, Google Earth files. And uh, this will pull up within Google Earth, all this stuff that you see off here to the left. So if you're looking for say, uh, Frog Pond Trail, see we've got Fisk Creek, Valley Vista, You're I'm, not sharing anymore. I'm not. Oh, that's right. I'm not sharing. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I was saying I've got so many in here. Oh, our frog pond. I've already already selected it. Let me uh, share that screen again here. Go to that one. That will come up, and you'll be able to see it. Uh, you can always export this, you know, to a GPS if you want to do that. So with that, why don't we go through some of the uh, some of the uh, the chat and uh, okay, great. Um, so let's see. Um, How about I start at the top and I can uh, cruise down here? All right. I tried answering some of the questions that I knew the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. So let me start off. Let's see. For kayaking, they said recommendations for first time kayaker in gear. Um, so I'm going to be completely biased here. I love inflatable kayaks, love them. Uh, part of that is because they're so easy to store. You roll them up, you got them in the garage. Uh, they don't take up a ton of room. They're also very resilient when you're going over rapids. So they, you know, they bend and flex. Uh, they're heaven to sleep in. It's like being on a giant air mattress when you're sleeping on the sandbar. And you can fit them in almost any vehicle. So when I started off doing this before I had my truck, I had a little 91 Honda Civic hatchback. And, um, you know, you roll up your boats, throw them in there, go have some adventure. The boats that I recommend, I really like the, um, the Air Tomcat series. They're a good entry-level high-pressure inflatable boat that's easily serviceable. And you can get either the um, two-person or the one-person and you can run the tandem, the two person as a one person because it's very adjustable where you put your seats. It's also good for overnight trips because you can lash all your gear. They got tons of tie downs and I think they run about 750. Um, and if that sounds like a lot of money, look at other high pressure boats. Those are in the thousands. And for $750, you get a boat that will last you like a dozen years if you take care of it. So your cost per trip is very low. I kind of liken it to, well, I could take the entire family skiing for a weekend, or I could buy a boat and take them kayaking for a dozen years. Can you, uh, can you say that name again, please? Yeah, AIR, it's A-I-R-E. And they've got something called, I think their Tomcat series, which is their slightly lower priced boats, but extremely durable. And I have run those exclusively down Cache Creek almost since the beginning. Uh, I actually finally wore one out. I bought it used as a boat from a concession. And after a dozen years, um, well, actually, I should say it isn't worn out. I use it as a wake boat now uh, and got a, got a new one to replace it. But it started delaminating. And so good for lake, not so much for white water at that point. And they're self-bailing. Um, the, there was a question about commercial groups that uh, lead kayaking tours. So not on the wilderness run. Uh, logistically, that would be very difficult for, for a group, but on the lower uh, fun run, there's uh, Cache Canyon River Trips and Whitewater Adventures. And Cache Canyon River Trips, uh, if you're looking for more sort of a family-oriented trip, uh, I'd recommend them. If you've got younger folks that like, you know, kids that want to go together in their teens or, you know, college age, 
uh, Whitewater Adventures seems to cater to more to that, that crowd. Both are great outfits. They provide you with really top-notch boats, uh, very affordable relative to uh, other trips I've seen in the state, and they typically run in the, in the summer months. So there's a question about the name Tuliomi. So Tuliomi uh, is a Lake Miwok uh, name that means deep home place. And it's actually a village site uh, in addition to um, that meaning. And it was, um, when we were trying to come up with our name, we were looking for place names, you know, cause that's really people go, oh, are we the Blue Ridge Conservancy or the Cache Creek this or the Blue Bar Puda Creek this? And everything that we came across was very sort of place specific and didn't really convene sort of the deeper feeling that we had for the place. And we were looking at historic maps and we come across the name Tuliomi and it's located at kind of almost the watershed divide between Peter Creek and Gash Creek. And the meaning held such meaning for us because our love of this place, the fact that I keep going back here all the time and, and I climb the mountains and tell the stories and go out and stand on the ridgetops when the wind is blowing and been intense when gale force winds are going, because just that, that deep connection to the place that we hope to have, that that name really conveyed it. It's, it's our deep home place. It's where we go for renewal and, and regeneration. And it was a name that invited people to ask that very question. Well, what does this mean? And then we can tell them, well, here's what it means and here's what we do. So um, do we lead kayak trips? So we have done trips through the concessions uh, but we don't lead trips specifically through the wilderness run. A lot of it is more of uh, word of mouth for, for that kind of thing. So if you have a boat and you know how to use it and you say, hey, next time you guys are up there, uh, let me know. Uh, that's usually how we do that. Um, so for, you know, for groups. And we do everything from, you know, a couple people to a dozen people. Uh, enough water to run it in a water year like this this winter. So we tend to run these in the summer when they're doing ag releases. Uh, and so when Indian Valley Reservoir has enough water and Clear Lake has enough water, you'll get um, enough water combined between those two for full ag deliveries to Yolo County, which is beautiful kayaking. It's kind of our hidden gem because a lot of the Sierra is very, you know, it's snow melt dependent, right? And their, their releases are more hydro. So as it gets warmer, the water goes up and as it gets cooler, the water goes down. In Yolo County, I can tell you what crops are growing and where they are by how high the river is. And so they put a lot down sort of early in the summer because they're irrigating all those tomatoes and corn. And as the tomatoes start ripening, the water starts going down. And by the time they're harvesting, the water's down even lower. But because it's time to the harvest cycle, you get kayaking generally from like April through August. It's a really long season. That is dependent upon having the water for irrigation. So uh, with, um, with the year that we're having now, if there's not enough irrigation water, then you really aren't gonna have summer kayaking. And meaning they might release some water for irrigation, but it won't be of the flows that you need. And the amount of flows that I generally recommend for doing the wilderness run is 500 to 550 at a minimum cubic feet per second it's really sublime at about 700 and at a thousand feet, it's wonderful, but you do it a lot faster. <laughs> so it might be like a nine hour float at 600, 700 CFS. And it's like a six hour float at a thousand CFS. People do raft this in the winter. And I've even seen people in large, you know, like eight foot, 14 foot Avon uh, group boats running it at 20,000 CFS. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little more confident in the summertime with the warmer air temperature, but uh, yeah, people will watch uh, flushes. And in fact, what I look at is um, a website called Dream Flows. And if you look at Dream Flows, it'll list the flows coming out of basically all the rivers that are runnable in California. And in the uh, Sacramento region, they have Cache Creek there. And I, I check those gauges there uh, for what the real time uh, flows are coming down. And like even after this storm, uh, I think it went up to like 40 or 50 CFS. So not a, a huge um, amount of water in there right now. We, it's been a pretty dry year. So let's see, question about how much of the area burn in the LNU Lightning Complex. Uh, basically the LNU uh, burned, um, well, it burned basically 
all of the Yolo County mountains, literally all of them, <laughs> uh, the mountains down to Fairfield, Blue Ridge, uh, both sides of Lake Berryessa with the exception of a little ring on the east shore uh, that had burned in 2018 and, and didn't burn this time. It burned Cedar Roughs, it burned where Zim Zim is, and then burned basically up to Frog Pond and stopped just about at Frog Pond and um, up to um, uh, Billy's Hill, which is off of Highway 16. So most of this burned in the LNU fire. So we'll see how these um, storms uh, deal with you know the runoff and the erosion. So there was a question about where we start the trip down the river. So yeah, Redbud Trailhead at Highway 20 is the put in, that's the North Fork. It's a little narrower. So mostly uh, water coming out of the North Fork, it's all Indian Valley. So you might have anywhere between 100 to 400 CFS. It's a very, it's a narrower stretch. So sometimes at like 400 CFS, there'll be a lot more brush you have to avoid. But after the first two miles, you pick up the main flow coming out of um, uh, Clear Lake. And then at that point, you pick up the remainder of the flow, the channel opens up and, and it's much easier. But I, I tell folks, you know, don't treat the river with respect. Uh, people go in with inner tubes and think they're just gonna float this little stretch and, and end up getting themselves stuck. Uh, so, you know, go in as you would approach anything with your first aid kit, your water, your food, your extra food, just in case, uh, and with other people who know where you are um, and are going with you. So California native orchids, um, I believe there are some on uh, Walker Ridge, but I don't know specific sites uh, within there, but I'm certain within this zone, we do have them. Someone else on the group might be able to get that one. Uh, map available to show all these trails. Well, I gave you the download link, so that's, you, know, you should all have those. There's no one individual map that has everything that I'm aware of, but because uh, everything's sort of going digital these days. Uh, are the hand crews mostly volunteer? Yes. Uh, one trail that we built, which we haven't had the grand opening for, it's the North End Trail at Lake Berry, a five mile trail we built with a grant, which was um, a contractor. And we were all set to have the grand opening and then the LNU complex burned through it. And so the area is closed right now. It's on Bureau of Reclamation land and they've closed that area. But um, it did not damage our trail and all the stone bridges that we have going over there. So we're just waiting for the area to reopen. But yes, hand crews are volunteer. We do all our work with volunteers and we've built miles and miles of trail with the volunteers that people are loving. Um, best season to visit Snow Mountain. Well, if you go on YouTube, you'll find a guy who, uh, man, I need to meet in person. This guy does split boarding. So a split board is a snowboard that splits in half and becomes basically cross country skis. And he goes up the side of Snow Mountain in winter and then hooks the board back together and then goes down and um, uh, snowboards. So haven't done that. People do snow camping in Snow Mountain. For those of us who don't wanna do that, I find uh, June, June, July are the best months for Snow Mountain. May can be cold. When I went up there and that photo um, that showed you us up there, you know, with the snow in May, it was 92 degrees at the base of Snow Mountain and it was 38 degrees when we got to the top of Snow Mountain. So a huge change in, uh, in um, temperature. Just, you know, again, you're going from, you know, a few hundred feet to 7,000 feet. And so you're down there and it's hot and you look up and top of the mountains right there, it should be the same temperature, right? Um, so I, I tend to find June is, is best and uh, June, July. And then August can be okay too. It'll be maybe like, you know, mid to high seventies, uh, less water sources, uh, but there are springs on the side of Snow Mountain when you get up to the mountain itself uh, that you can find water in. And then after that, I feel like it just gets a little too warm. Particularly now, we've been finding that by the time you hit the end of August, you're kind of in fire season, right? And so some of these areas are on fire. So I'm kind of got this narrow window that I can do the, the backpacking in in this area just to make sure that I'm not, not hitting that. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, there's a question of Frog Pond Trail. It just sort of says Frog Pond Trail in question. Um, but uh, Frog Pond Trail did get hit by the LNU fire. The back half of it is a little obscured because of the fire going through there. I went up a couple weeks ago, again, Tuliomi volunteering, and I pin flagged 
the exact route of the trail, the existing trail, uh, where it had been um, obscured by a fire break and uh, some of the fire damage. And over the course of this winter and into spring, we're going to be repairing that and basically fixing that loop again. Um, but because I have the GPS track, um, was able to uh, redefine it. So we're working with the BLM on that. So then, uh, Let's see, best trail to view California native plants. Uh, Frog Pond is fantastic for that and very accessible. Same with High Bridge. Redbud Trail is really good for that. The red buds and the poppies and lupins that you'll see on that are fantastic. So you notice I didn't just give you one best trail. California native plants abound in here. And so any of the trails will get you there. The best place to see the combination of wildflowers is to go up to Walker Ridge just off Highway 20 at the edge of the monument. Um, and, and basically take any of the spurs off to Walker Ridge. But you'll be interfacing with a lot more off-road vehicles in that zone. Uh, so if you're really looking for a more primitive experience, uh, any of the one like High Bridge would be a fantastic one. You'll only see maybe horses. And uh, if you see an intrepid mountain biker, you'll be lucky. Uh, it may or may not be me. The wilderness are unreasonable to do in a canoe. So uh, I would say yes, if it's a whitewater canoe and you've got float bags, or if it's a regular canoe that has float bags, but um, a regular longer like, you know, old town canoe, I wouldn't recommend that. I think it's just not as um, maneuverable as like a one person, uh, um, one person canoe. Uh, so question about artifacts or cultural resources you find during trail cutting. So absolutely fantastic uh, question because for one, uh, do not disturb any cultural artifacts. Uh, we are not the original inhabitants of these mountains. They were highly occupied. Uh, by indigenous uh, tribes, um, uh, Yochidehi, uh, uh, Winter Nation. Um, all of the tribes are on Clear Lake. There was a lot of intermingling between uh, trading and, and hunting. So there are artifacts up there that abound. There are village sites. Um, if you see anything, you leave it. Uh, even picking it up, you don't want to do. Um, Disturbing is is you know just destroys the cultural heritage that we have up there that uh, uh, that we share. So what do we do with anything we find during trail cutting? Well, we uh, we have not, and the reason is because before we do any trail work, we get uh, archaeologists archaeologists to sign off, and we do all the environmental documentation, be it CEQA or NEPA, uh, California Environmental Quality Act or uh, national. Uh, so depending on which agency we're working on, right? If it's BLM land, it's federal, we do NEPA. If it's uh, county, we do CEQA. So we do an environmental analysis first. We uh, go through the trail alignment to make sure we're not going through anywhere culturally sensitive. And then at that point, uh, we have not discovered anything because we've uh, hopefully avoided all those things. Most of where we build uh, trails to are sort of steeper areas where you wouldn't have had inhabitation or um, if folks were hunting, you might find little flakes of obsidian where they were like sharpening a, a tool. Um, on one occasion, when we were walking a trail alignment with BLM, we actually found a little obsidian shard in where we were going to enjoy the trail. And uh, so we rerouted it, we moved it, left, left everything there, just moved in. It was just what they called isolates, which is basically someone had been hunting the area and was sharpening the tool. So it wasn't a big cultural site from a standpoint of a, a tool making factory or a village. Um, mushroom hunting, I'm certain it does. And that is not my specialty. I can tell you there are mushrooms galore up here. Uh, frog pond trail and in particular now after the fires, you'll probably find all manner of mushrooms up here. Uh, Either go with someone who knows what they're picking and eating or um, be very experienced yourself because you don't want to eat the wrong thing. Uh, there's a question about the CFS. We talked about that, dream flows, um, spring wildflowers, uh, five mile round trip. So I'd say uh, red bud is a good one to baton flat. That's a really good one. And then high bridge, just kind of going up and back. Uh, it would be a really good one. Frog pond trail, of course, but that's not as, you know, uh, Good right now because of the post fire condition, but Tuliomi is on the ground and fixing these things. In fact, and I got to give a little plug for us here the fire hit, the fire finished. A month later, we were up there at Valley Vista Park. We replaced all the stairs, the trails, took all the down trees out, got the trail up and running, and it was good to go. And I think it was finished by October. So we like to get up there and just 
get things back and ready for folks. And we've run across a lot of uh, people um, who are local Rumsey residents that are so excited about uh, the work that we've been doing and that's awesome. So let's see, uh, does Redbud Trail have Western, Western Redbuds? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And if you go up anywhere in here in the early spring, the Redbuds are off the hook. And what's really fun for me is as you go up in elevation, like the red buds might be just popping in uh, Rumsey and then you'll go up like 200 feet up and they're not quite there yet. So you get to enjoy red buds throughout the season. Uh, best trail for black bears. I would say uh, Judge Davis trail, uh, five miles down into Cache Creek and then um, basically camp there. Wilson Valley area is kind of bear central in terms of where they move around. Uh, so I've seen them Wilson Valley area and deeper in the heart of the wilderness when I go way, you know, off trail. Uh, email address for more questions. I think Bill can probably answer that. I think we've got an info at tuliomi.org. It would be general. That's uh, right. I'll put it in there. That correct? Okay. And then, um, hey, Tom and Meg Stollard. Good to see you guys. Uh, Tom and Meg have gone on the wilderness run with me kayaking and I have dragged them up to the top of uh, Glasscock Mountain and, and I'm going to speak on their behalf and say that they wouldn't have traded all of that for anything, even though I pulled them up the side of the mountain, although they may be swearing at me under their breath or uh, on the camera right now. Uh, parking lots of the Homestead Trail are bursting on nice days, yes. Um, yeah, the importance of stay, not hiking on closed trails, it's its hard. We've been working cooperatively with um, Cold Canyon since Tuliomi purchased uh, land at the top of Cold Canyon to open up Annie's Trail Loop and soon to be a new trail up to the mountaintop. We've been, I don't want to say thwarted, but set back by numerous fires uh, coming in, which keeps shortening our seasons uh, that we can do things. But um, it's really... Uh, combination of outreach that we've been doing and the signs that are out there. And I suppose if you talk with other folks that you see there, the hard part is that it's kind of a numbers game, right? If you've got, um, based on what we've been talking about with the, the folks um, at Cold Canyon, if 90% of the people are following the rules, it's that other 10% that are kind of ruining it. Uh, and the other 10%, sometimes you just can't reach. Um, they just, you know, they're like, I can do what I want. Kind of like a little like mask wearing in some ways, but um, we've seen a significant reduction in the amount at the Homestead Trail, even though the parking lot's full, it's not as bad as it was. But you're right, it's it's tough and it's, it's very sad to see those impacts. Um, for folks that are trying to do um, uh, hiking, you know, alternatives, I'd say, you know, going up to Blue Ridge, Frog Pond, High Bridge, much less crowded. High Bridge Tails, I might see one or two other cars up there. So, uh, and the distance is not that much further than, than Cold Canyon, really. Uh, trail suggested for mountain biking. Okay, I'm going to give you my, uh, my two cents on this. Everything in the Bear Creek unit of the Cache Creek Natural Area, which means Cache Creek Ridge Trail, High Bridge Trail, Lynch Canyon, uh, not the one down in Vacaville, but the one up here off Highway 20. All that trail network, there's maybe 70 miles worth in that Bear Creek unit of Cache Creek Natural Air. So it's everything off Highway 60 and 20. And my favorite way to do this is I do it as a car shuttle and you leave a car at uh, High Bridge and then you drive up to the Judge Davis Trailhead and then you ride Cache Creek Ridge Trail and then you hook back down to the Lynch Canyon Trail to the Three Ponds Trail, to the High Bridge Trail. And that is the sweet way to do it because it's more downhill than uphill, even though there's you know a little uphill rolling on the up and down, particularly at the beginning of the Judge Davis uh, Trailhead to Cache Creek Ridge. But the downhill on the High Bridge Trail is sublime. It's single track, five miles of continuous descent, breathtaking, and you're not like, trying to deal with everybody else that's that's up there too, right? This area very lightly visited both in hikers, horseback riders and mountain bikers. So I mountain biked um, up at Forest Hill Divide, uh, did that loop, love that loop, but you're gonna see a lot of people up there, right? You come up here and just not that many. Um, I also like to mountain bike actually Ray House Road because it's a dirt road, but it's closed to, uh, you know, like cars and trucks, it's open to dirt bikes and, and 
uh, quads. Um, but you know, generally once they get sort of up there, they're a little bit more dispersed. Uh, but I've ridden that as a mountain bike ride, but that one's always funny because it was two hours for me to get to the summit and then 20 minutes to get back down. So, <laughs> but it was a heck of a descent. Uh, so yeah, those would be the ones that, that I would uh, like to uh, talk, talk about. Um, and yeah, Sally, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad um, that's wonderful. Uh, your people have occupied the area for millennia and the history back there is so incredible. And we've actually been working, um, starting to work with Yoche de Hay on um, some of the cultural preservation work. And we're trying to get some management of um, uh, fire in this area uh, cooperatively because cultural sites are being dozed by fire breaks. And we've got to prevent that. We need to preserve this area for that. It's a, a very sacred mountain, uh, the Walker Ridge area. There are springs up there that put out a, a salty carbonated water that is the most amazing taste. You, you don't necessarily want to be drinking, but I just put it in my mouth and swish it. And to come across that, you feel like you're in Yellowstone or Yosemite where this orange algae is growing off the sides of this highly saline uh, serpentine uh, mineral spring. Just amazing. Uh, so elk, yes. So I've seen elk deep in the Cache Creek wilderness. Uh, saw nine uh, two years ago, uh, floating through there, beautiful. And um, a lot of people see them on the side of the highway. And I kind of joke that I never see them on the side of the highway and everybody sees them on the side of the highway. But uh, along Highway 20, at the intersection of Highway 16 and 20, you'll see them sometimes. I see them more down by, by Cache Creek. Um, thank you, Ann, I really appreciate that. It's, uh, as you can tell, I extremely passionate about this area and I've just sort of put my life's dedication to working for it. But the reward is seeing everybody out there enjoying the trails. The, the, as hard as it is to build them as much sweat and, and, uh, and blood there is, you know, some blood, I don't get too injured, but <laughs> uh, to build these things, it really is when I see other people up there, particularly with families, it's, it's, it's the reward because people did that for me for when I grew up, right? In the 1970s, people made the Mid Peninsula Open Space District. And I didn't know who those people were, but they made something that profoundly impacted me in a positive way. And if I can do that for the next generation, even if they have no idea who I was, it doesn't matter because that's our obligation to future generations. So with that, um, I think I've answered the uh, questions in the chat. So there's, there's, there's one any... more about um volunteer trail opportunities. Yes, and yes. There actually is an event coming up uh, just, just a couple of weeks, I think, to work Yeah, on we've got them on trail. our uh, webpage for events, and then there's a meetup group uh, that has that, Bill. You might be able to put the link in there. And um, when we're not in the restricted, you know, stay-at-home order, uh, we've been able to do trail events, which is why we were able to build a rebuild rather Valley Vista after the fire and everyone's up there. It's a great physical distance activity because you're not swinging a pickaxe <laughs> near somebody else, hopefully. And, um, and, you know, we've got, everyone's got their masks on and uh, uh, coming in separate vehicles, which unfortunately is not the most eco, but we actually find when families go up there because they're looking for something to do, they're, you know, getting cabin fever. And so we spread out and do the trail work. And so we had to shut that down when the governor's um, stay at home, you know, when we got above like purple plus or whatever it was. But now we're able to do these outdoor events again. So we're going to be doing that on the uh, uh, Valley Vista work day. Uh, in fact, that one I need to talk with Nate because we may actually swap it out and, and just go up the road a little bit and do Frog Pond now that I've, I've, uh, I've flagged it. Uh, let's see. Will the presentation be available on the website? That's going to be Bill, who's recording it. Yes, uh, and I'm then... recording it, and it's going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, since okay. you guys are registered, I'm going to be sending out a note to all the registered folks to to have a direct link to that presentation, and then we'll we'll put it up on our just regular newsletter as well. So fishing opportunities, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about fishing, but I'll give you a handful within the uh, Peter and Cash Creek area. So um, of course, obviously Lake Berryessa uh, and the inner dam stretch very much. So uh, Cash Creek, people don't really think about fishing on Cash Creek, but there are people that really like uh, both bass, bluegill, sunfish. Um, and uh, uh, some people like to fish for carp too, because it's supposed to be a really good fighting fish. 
a little bit more passive. You get like the meatballs or whatever, and you put it out there and it sits on the ground, and, you know, and the underwater and you kind of wait. In fact, funny story. Uh, when I was kayaking um, last, gosh, was it last summer? Yeah, last summer kayaking down and I was going by the campground and there was someone who was fishing and their line was stuck in the middle of the creek. And I kayaked down and I said, I can try and unstick your lure for you. And man, this thing was just wedged like between some rocks. And so I was able to paddle in the rapid, still get around, pull this thing. And then I felt it like come loose, but it was still tugging. And I pulled it up and it was a big old 12 inch fish on the end of the line. The fish had somehow worked its way like between a couple rocks. And so I was on the other side and I was able to pull it out. Oh, they were laughing on shore. And so anyway, they were having a good time. Cash Creek is good. Uh, and then um, when I was talking about the swimming pond slash bass pond, if you hike up into the Bear Creek unit uh, off High Bridge Trail, beautiful bass up there. You can catch your limit. And the fly fishers of Davis love to go up there and, and, uh, and bass fish up there. And then uh, let's see. I think that's it. That's <clears throat> it. Very good. All right. Do we require people to wear masks on group hikes? So, you know, it's a good practice. Um, if you're physically apart from folks, uh, you know, it's safer uh, to not have it, but it's, it's a good practice when you're around folks. And I find, you know, given the pace of hiking, uh, a mask isn't really so much like if I'm jogging, I literally, I can't, I'm jogging, I'm trying to breathe, but uh, hiking, it's not that bad. Uh, and the same thing with the trail building. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to stay safe. We're trying to keep everybody, uh, uh, trying to keep everybody healthy. And God, the last thing I want to see is a super spreader event uh, <laughs> on there. So some thank yous, uh, bird watching trips. You know, um, Yolo Audubon is the group that does the bird watching. Not only the experts, but they come into this area quite a bit. Another story is there was a time where I was climbing off trail with a group. I just literally said, okay, we're going up that ridge to Cortina Ridge and we we're hiking up. We we're above the upper park site in Yolo County. And we looked down and we saw this little group of people looking at us through binoculars. And I said, that's ah, probably birders. And sure enough, when I get to work, uh, uh, you know, the following Monday, it was my old boss, Sid England, and he was leading a birding group up there. And he goes, oh, I saw you climbing up the side of the mountain. I thought nobody would be dumb enough to climb up the side of that mountain, but Andrews. <laughs> and he was right. All right. I think that uh, I hit the end of the thing. Okay. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And, you know, we appreciate everyone. Uh, you're the reason Tuliomi does what we do. Uh, if, if people didn't support us, why would we be doing it, right? Uh it, we're trying to give back, and then the fact that community is responding like this uh, to have you know over 100 people at a uh, at a talk uh, is is just really inspiring. And and I hope to see you all out there um, enjoying. And when when we all get our vaccines, downing. we're going to be hitting the. Oh, I think there's going to be like a double bump of like there was a bump of people going stir crazy to get out there, and then there's going to be this like amazing like tourism jump uh, hotels are going to be booked i can just feel the energy of people when you do that uh, i should say the last thing before uh, i go is there was some talk about f uh, fishing there's also hunting in this area a lot of people do uh, turkey and uh, and boar hunting up here um, they do deer as well and some have some success but there's definitely more you know turkey and wild boar if you're into sort of you know sustainable um harvesting your own food. This is a great place to do it. We find a lot of folks, uh, particularly uh, Hmong, uh, do it from Sacramento. A very viv uh, vibrant community there comes up here to hunt uh, uh, wild pigs. So if you want to be a local vor, this is the place to do it. You could catch your, your protein and then come down through Cash Creek, uh, stop at one of the local farmers uh, there and, and get your greens. So with that, uh, I'm going to sign off and have dinner and I, I wish everyone a, a good evening. Thank you, Bill, for organizing. And as always, uh, enjoy the region. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Take care, okay. folks. End the meeting. <laughs>